My guest on this episode of the Neil Wilkins podcast is Lee Stewart. Now, Lee is one of the very few sustainability consultants with over 20 years of experience. He has worked with the likes of Fujitsu as uh, regional head of sustainability, as well as more recently head of sustainability at Fontara, New Zealand's largest business. So who better qualified today to talk to us about the really hot topic of how to build sustainability into your business strategy. So I'm really excited to find out actually how to do this myself. So welcome to the podcast, Lee. Great. Thanks, Neil. It's great to be here. So, I mean, your background, your experience, you've been doing this for a long, long time. You must uncover so many pain points that I'm sure the audience listening and watching this will certainly resonate with. Why why do you think this stuff is just so difficult to do when it should be so easy? Yeah, I think um, a lot of people get tied up in knots and jargon and um, scientific speak, um, framework speak, finance, everything's coming at it at once, regulatory legal customer consumer there's a lot and you and you know, rightfully an exec or someone in business you feel like you're an attack on all sides this sustainability esg what does it all mean and then you could be forgiven to say man it's too hard i'll probably just wait and see and, and hold off by doing things because if i go hard too fast too early am i bored or everyone's gonna you know what am i gonna do i don't want to be the one you know going way out ahead of the pack and get crucified for that or lose value and things so I, I i i feel for a lot of boards as they're grappling with this subject and um it, it's, it's complicated unfortunately mm, do you think it is that feeling of exposure because again i'm sure yeah. people listening to this will, will kind of you know resonate and feel this it it kind of you, you kind of you get a sense that there is a huge potential value in doing this, obviously for planet and yeah. for society, but also there's a and I want to come on to this as well, the kind of the um the financial sort of incentives yeah. of doing this. Yeah. And because you know there is a, a big kind of brand positioning competitive angle to it. But do you feel that there's almost the the kind of risk reward equation is so skewed towards this this kind of fear of exposure? Do, do you think that's what's putting a lot of people off? Yeah, and when I look at some of the senior execs, uh, you know, teams I've been a part of, and 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 you look at how they've been promoted and grown, they've in their careers, they've been they've sort of been promoted by not making mistakes, you know. So there's that fear of, um, you know, I want to go out there, I don't want to make mistakes, but I don't want to be the person that makes this mistake, or and it's probably easy to do no decision and kick that can down the road. So you you're seeing it happen at governments and everywhere around the world. There's massive investments needed now because they haven't kept up over time and it kind of sort of um, can sort of really raise its ugly head all of a sudden quickly but really it's been a, a combination of impacts over the last decade or longer where people have sort of just pushed that aside pushed it aside then all of a sudden bang it sort of hits you really hard and it hurts so what you need to look at uh, with sustainability when i try to talk to all my clients and everyone it's, it's it's a long game okay there will be quick wins along the way but you need to set that long-term target, North Star, and stay true to that. There will be deviations, but you've got to be playing the long game here. Mm. Is, is there kind of like a, almost like a million dollar ticket here that you can actually sort of say, here's, here's that kind of ticket that if you play this card, if we use a you know sort of poker analogy or something like yeah. that, you play this card and, it, and it's almost a, a given that people will then get on side because because that longer game, I mean, we all know there's a huge value in doing that, but I guess with the financial, economic and all the various pressures yeah. that you know many businesses are facing right now, the short game is the one that is is kind of winning out. Is is there almost like a definitive long game card that if you play it, it's something like oh, now we can we can actually kind of relax into this and almost enjoy a longer journey. Yeah, if I reflect back on my early parts of career, you mentioned I worked for Fujitsu. Um, they had sustainability targets out a hundred years in, in advance. You know, they had that long term Japanese ethos of thinking of. A legacy leaving your job better than the last person comes in leaving the planet society better off um even when they built their factories in the early 1920s 30s they replaced the parkland you know the trees they had to chop down to make that factory they built a park next door to it and that's still there today so they've got these sort of um icons of long-term thinking and and that's that's really 
um, prevalent that we sort of miss in sort of the Western society where we're looking at quarterly reporting, um, you know, short cycles of politicians, hard to make long-term decisions. Um, the worst thing for business is uncertainty, which sustainable policies have brought to a lot of the Western democracies and so forth. So you're finding it really hard for them to actually plan long-term. But as you said, I do believe there is that golden ticket there for those that methodically keep consistent uh, month by month, year by year, progressing towards targets. We all know the direction we need to go and there will be wins along the way and some big wins and some small, some sacrifices, yes, you need to make, but overall that direction, you know, everything's pointing the way going more sustainable is, is, is not an option really for most companies that I work with. Mm. So it's feeling actually you've given me a lot of confidence here, Lee, because it is kind of feeling a little bit more like it's an evolution rather than a revolution. And I think yeah. maybe that's part of this kind of risk reward fear kind of element. People yeah. think, oh, we've got to change everything or, oh, look at our supply yeah. chain. There's no way we could yeah. kind of accommodate yeah. that into our thinking. And, oh, we can't even work out our kind of office recycling policy, let alone actually do yeah. some of these big <laughs> items. Yeah. But I, th I think what you're saying, if and correct me if I'm wrong here, is that those little steps incrementally take us in the right direction. So it's almost like if we commit to this for you know, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, that's incredible, yeah. then we can actually begin to take some slower, steadier steps to build that confidence and momentum. Yeah, yeah. and I would challenge every company, everyone that's listening today, you're doing good stuff, I, I, I generally guarantee it you're probably not bringing it to life in the form of a, of a strategic plan and a consistent effort. But every customer I've worked with has been pleasantly surprised once I've gone out across the business, interviewed stakeholders, said, by the way, do you know you're actually doing these sort of bits of all, all over the place? If you put it together part of a strategy, that's 20, 30% there of what you need to do. And you've already got people engaged doing things in your business. And these could be just things like charity days and bake-offs and other things like that, or someone's really enthusiastic around environment has done something around one factory that could be replicated across all sites. Um, these are just little bits of pockets of excellence are, are going on. And my, my, my real call out to your listeners is understand what's going on around that and see how you can amplify that. And that's a great place to start. Hmm. Do, do you see, I'm curious about any kind of patterns or trends that you see, and I guess if we sort of take individual sectors out of this so that we can obviously yeah. make this as generic, but hopefully as useful yeah. to everybody, do you, do you see certain patterns within businesses overall where you can sort of say, hey, I think maybe the quick wins, if we want to build this kind of confidence and take out this kind yeah. of fear, often we see it in product or we see it yeah. in process or we see it in people. Are they, I'm going with the marketing mix yeah. here. You yeah. know, are, yeah. are there certain areas of business that you would argue it's most likely to be able to get those quick wins from? Yeah, and I think if, you, if you're grappling about where you should start and what you should do, um, understand where your money comes from. And those are the clients you service. Who are your clients you service? If, they, if they're large listed entities, they're likely to have a sustainability report and some targets. Have a read of that and understand that because you as a supplier to them have an opportunity to help them meet those targets and they're probably grappling with the same issues you are about how do I do this, how do I work on that? And that's a great opportunity to collaborate and be more closer to your customer. So I really emphasize in the book, staying close to the money has probably saved my career a couple of times when there were cuts and and, you know, and redundancies going on, I helped the sales team differentiate themselves against their competitors because they added sustainability into a, a very um, commoditized bid, so to speak. But I managed to calculate the emission savings by coming towards us as opposed to a competitor, tied that to their climate targets they had and said, we'll actually help you meet that target by a few percent or something like that. And it made it, that's a differentiator you can bring. So for your marketers out there, understand what, what's the client needs and, and so forth. What are their targets, objectives, and how do you support that as a supplier? So that's the real key trend I'm seeing. And there's also a lot of forced legislation down anyway. So if you're supplying a large, you might be a small in, enterprise, if you're supplying a large company, you're bound to be asked the questions about, do you have a climate target? What's your modern slavery policy? Where do you source these materials from? What happens at end of life? All these other things around it. Or if you use animals in your supply chain, what's your animal welfare? 
if you've got a supply chain that spans across different countries and different jurisdictions, you know, where, you know, where is modern slavery identified as weaknesses in your supply chain is a real big one. So these are all coming at you, whether you're a large company, um, you're already aware of it, but they're now pushing down to the smaller guys. And, and it's just a matter of time before you get asked these questions for sure. Mm. This is, this is interesting because it, it almost feels counterintuitive, doesn't it? That you look outside before you look inwards. And I, you know, I guess having, you know, sort of been involved in this for, for many, many years myself is that I, I guess the common practice that certainly that I've seen and probably I've evangelized too is, mm. is kind of begin with stuff, you know, and you can trust because mm. it's internal. But actually what you're saying is that most of the clues are coming through from collaboration and your customers. Yeah. That's a really yeah. interesting perspective to be almost yeah. look starting by looking outside. Yeah, yeah. I do. I do recommend before you go out talking about sustainable, you sort out your own backyard first, of course. So you have targets and so forth. But one thing I stress in 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 the book is doing what's known as a materiality assessment. Uh, most sustainably, people would know what that is. But that's asking key questions of your stakeholders, both internally. And externally, I tried to include customers in that, even government, NGOs as well. But you're asking them specific questions. What do you want to see from us in terms of sustainability? What's more important? Is it climate change, modern slavery, uh, waste, um, diversity and inclusion, um, how we interact with our community? What is the key priorities there? And that should form the foundation for your strategy and what you go after. And, and I'm not talking about 17 or 17 sustainable development goals i'm talking about three or four really honed in areas that also have the other concept i'll throw out there is a shared value so if you're looking at a business that say maybe an it business that has a gender issue and a talent issue you might want to look at how do i get more girls into it or how do i support the local schools near where we supply it to get more girls and women in, in IT, which benefits us as well as society. So there's a mutual benefit and you're not just giving money away to a charity, which is good, but it has some additional benefit to the business. So these are all um, fantastic opportunities worth exploring to actually really elevate your profile. And the other untapped benefit also is um, your own internal staff actually really like these stories. Um, they might not know what's going on, but they want to hear what's going on, you know, and they want to work for a company that's actually doing good. So mm. there's a real opportunity there as well. Mm. And it feels really tangible to me, just the way you're describing it, Lee, it just yeah. feels, it's like it's measurable, it's yeah. it's achievable, it's kind of, well, it's smart. I mean, it's, it's realistic yeah. and it's time bound if yeah. you want to make it that way. So, yeah. so there's almost like it, what you're creating is a real kind of, um, foundation of evidence here that yep. we're making yep. progress because I think one of the things that I see and I'd, I'd be interested in your take on this is that where organizations have almost taken a few steps but then failed to build the momentum it's yep. because they're not logging and tracking the progress yep. which of course is so so but, valuable isn't it yeah yeah and I talk about there's three stages to the book and one is confidence so it's understanding what are these global issues climate change modern slavery waste what they all mean and what is the relevance to my business then there is the um, commitment phase so what are you going to stand for that's where you might want to set some targets some goals some objectives and most companies stop there they forget about the other one which i talk about as a key one is consistency so how do you make sure the governance around that maintains relevance and and a lot of these sustainability teams are small you might even be a volunteer people and when they people they might move on. Generally, they're really good performers. They get promoted or headhunted to go somewhere else. And then you come around the annual time to write a sustainability report or your annual report. Everyone's asking, where did, where did Johnny go? Oh, well, he left and there's nothing there. So what you've got to make sure is that it's a, a decentralized model of governance. So that say, for instance, the climate targets, the office of the COO, um, reporting and so forth, the CFO is on the hook for that. And as and, you know, diversity, gender, obviously sort of falls into HR. And these people are responsible for quarterly updates to your board and executive on progress. Um, so you don't miss out. You, you know, I see so many failures of, you know, big hoopla, big marketing campaign around, here's our new climate target, here's our new sustainability strategy, some big fanfare. And a year later, what's gone? You know, it's just nothing, you know, 
they just set some targets. It, there's nothing, no follow through. So they were, they were starting to get found out too, these companies as well. Mm. Yeah. And so, so I, I guess, I mean, one of the things that you said right at the, the start of our conversation was, was the whole thing about storytelling, use the word storytelling. Yeah. And it's kind of an interesting one, isn't it, really? Because I, I guess there's a different take in that story for everybody in different disciplines. So as you say, you talk about the CFO there, their take on the value of this could be quite different in the the kind of the narrative and the conversations that are being had versus HR or by you know, yeah. sales director or the chief marketing officer or whoever. They're going to be having a different perspective on you know the value of actually you know in, in yeah. integrating this into plans and activities yeah. how do you kind of work that into the that's kind of storytelling yeah. them within a business because that's a tricky one yeah. isn't it yeah it, it is but um what i try and do is you interview the key stakeholders the executive team and then the message to the cfo is very different to the hr so the message to the cfo i'm wanting to know are you trying to get access to capital in the future are you aware of you know that sustainable linked loans or sustainable finance framework will probably help ensure you to get lower basis points and access to capital that might not exist in the future. Um, if you're a listed company, are you aware of these investor questions that might be asked at your next AGM? How do you answer them around climate risk or climate adaptation or how you're going to get to net zero? All these sort of real targeted um, questions and help to support them because the sustainability strategy will ultimately, I've worked with many CFOs, um, helps them secure their business and makes it more resilient. So, for instance, um, work with another client, um, they will not get wrapped up in a, an enlisted entity, will not be included in a sustainable fund. They just won't know about it because they don't have a policy and a strategy. They just won't be picked up by either it's an AI engine or an analyst. They won't be included in that because they do not have a climate target, liquid science, modern slavery report, whistleblower um, policy. DNI targets and so forth. It just doesn't get included. So you're already missing out and you don't know about it. Um, likewise, if you're talking to HR, I mentioned before, attracting talent and keeping talent, people are so much more savvy these days. They're not just coming for a paycheck. They're coming for a purpose. And what is the purpose of your business? What are you actually doing? How are you influencing the society and wider world? Is it positive or negative? And if it's negative, what are you doing to fix it? If it's positive, what are you doing to amplify that and have a bigger purpose and how you bring your people on board? That's just huge, right? Um, and the list goes on, you know, op operations, cost savings around energy efficiency, but also resilience in supply chains, shocks and, and so forth. Um, a lot of us has also got leg uh, legislation coming through around climate risks and disclosure. So um, there's such a broad topic, sustainability, and I found it been really exciting. You can have a conversation almost with everyone about it. You might not even use the word sustainability because you might come across some people that really get upset about that word and don't believe in anything about that. But you can start talking about, oh, do you want to access new markets or charge a premium for a product? Or, or do you want to actually lower your costs? Do you want to attract new talent? Do you want to secure your business for the future if you want to access capital? So these are just certain questions where sustainability is the underlying support theme that helps it. Mm. So a tricky question for you here, Lee, and, and yeah. I, you know, this is almost the ultimate question, isn't it? So I'm not necessarily expecting a direct answer and just say, hey, Neil, yeah, work yeah. in progress. But is there an alternative word to sustainability then? Because yeah. it, it is one of these yeah. things that it just, it, it, the, the devil's in the detail, isn't it, really? Yeah. Because as you yeah. say, you can you can kind of really uncover amazing opportunities there but it's actually yeah. nothing to do with what you might term sustainability. And then yeah, you look across yeah. and then somebody else defines it differently and says, oh, yeah, yeah, but it's this, it's that. Oh, are we actually saying the wrong thing? I, I fully agree with you, Neil. I haven't, haven't got a real answer for it because it means, and I, sometimes I start a workshop by write down what does sustainability mean to you and you will get a diverse views. And I put that on the whiteboard. That's what I start the workshop with. This is what it means to you context and this is what i think it means it might mean um just doing better with what you've got and trying to not ruin the planet and society as you go along right uh, to hopefully growing to being beneficial to that so um so i talk about you might have a ledger of where you might be negative to the environment with your operations but how do you get that to positive over time so do you put back more than you take 
and the same with society. So that's a simplistic view, but you'll get a diverse view across the spectrum. But what I do really like about the word, everyone generally knows what it means, but you can craft that message to support um, most outcomes, if that makes sense. Um, and the ethos and underlying, um, oh, not sort of, I don't say rules, but underlying, underlying intent is there to do good, really. So that's really what I like to see with mm. the word. And it has been misconstrued many times. And I'm really sorry we haven't come up with a better one. Mm, it is, yeah, and I think there's probably this sort of a collective need uh, ultimately yeah. to do that, yeah. and I, I, I don't know the answer, so I just thought I'd kind of yeah. throw that yeah. one in there. But but I do yeah. love this kind of essence of, you know, there's a, new, a number of things that you've kind of said there. You've used the word purpose, you've said values, you've now used the phrase doing good. I think yeah. there's just something really deep in terms of integrity, authenticity, yeah. honesty, and just doing the right yeah. thing. I mean, this is yeah. good business, isn't it, yeah. really? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And working around the sustainable community like I have for so long, when I talk to my peers, even competitors in sustainable, we, we, we all want to collaborate much differently if we were from a marketing or sales or finance background. It's a very generally collegiate sort of view of sustainable professionals that – uh, they're all very well purpose driven, just a little bit different from the business people. We all really get on and support each other. And that's really something I really like about that community, especially here across Australia and New Zealand, where I spent most of my time. There's a regular meetup groups where you get 100 people for a drink once a month, you know, and they're all that's sort of my crowd. And it's great to chat and, and so forth. So there's a real yeah, there's we're just wired a little bit different purpose driven, which actually gives us a little bit more in the tank to do that bit extra, I think. Mm, and this, yeah, it just feels right, doesn't it? And yeah, I think, you know, yeah. I can just tell by the glint in your eye that that is yeah. a, it yeah. is a kind of almost like a lifelong journey for you now. You can just tell just by the energy that comes yeah. through that. It's yeah. like, yeah, yeah, this is what makes us different. This is yeah. what makes it special, but yeah. so, so important. And yet, and I'm sure you see this as well, there will be business owners, chief execs, managing directors, you know, micro business, yeah. startups, et cetera, et cetera, who say still, well, I, yeah, great, but I haven't really got time for that. Yeah. Is, there, is there an argument here that says, but this is business of the future. Yeah. So if you yeah. want to be in business, there is no real alternative because the yeah. old way of doing business, it's gone. So the main reason why I actually wrote that book was for that specific business leader who's just thinking, oh my God, this stuff is too hard. Why should I bother? I've got other things to focus on. I've got to make money. I've got to be profitable. I've got HR issues. I've, I've got to stick to what I know. But why I wrote the book was to actually open the horizon for those types of business leaders who are smart, very savvy, very capable to the opportunity that sustainably presents itself. So as for a lot of reasons I've already spoke about before, you know, you might want to try and open up new markets, might try to get a premium for your product, uh, might look to have a more resilient supply chain might be an issue. You might have learned those lessons over the last few years of disruption. How can that help me? I might try, I'm, I'm trying to attract new talent, especially young talent, and I'm finding that hard because they're, they're more purpose-driven. And although my company does good, but that, it doesn't spell it out explicitly like, a sustainable strategy would. So this book was really written for that type of person. And I wrote it as I was working with those type of clients who go and we sort of maybe sort of on the compliance side had to do something, but then realized, hey, there's a real opportunity here. If we set the foundations right, have a conservative, real thorough sustainability strategy that actually now looks beyond ourselves as an organization. How do we help our customers? How do we help society? and the wider environment where we operate in, do better. So there's numerous examples in the book of how you can do that. And really by having a strategy with a focus and the right governance models, you can open yourself up to these other opportunities. Mm. I know in the book you talk about, um, I guess we, in some uh, sort of circles is actually quite a taboo word, but I think from a commercial perspective, it's really important, the word profit. So it's yeah. actually balancing purpose, values, sustainability, all these yeah. kind of terms with the word profit, because it almost it has to dovetail in to get 
a, a longevity to yeah. it, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Profit's key in all the businesses, you know. Um, without it, you do not exist. That's quite fundamental. Um, so, yeah, definitely aligning the strategy of your sustainable strategy to where the money comes in is one of the key tips that I give. And it's that's looking at what your customers are wanting, uh, are, are, are sort of alluding to. Some might even be demanding it. So how do you place yourself in that good light with your new, with your existing clients but also maybe there's something in this that might be able to attract more clients and make you stand above your competitors as well in the marketplace. So can this give you a differentiator and create more value to your business? Because I guess with that differentiator comes competitiveness. It almost positions you differently, maybe from everybody else in your market, certainly from those who are close to you uh, in terms of competition. If they're not doing this stuff, that there's a, a financial, there's a positioning, yeah. there's a branding, there's a, an inherent yeah. goodness to all of this stuff. There's, yeah. there's almost like no reason why you wouldn't do this, is there? Yeah, I haven't found many reasons why you wouldn't. Um, and I would say, if you're armed with some knowledge around sustainability, you can open up doors and have conversations with any level and anyone across the business and with your marketplace as well. And I've, I've done that where I've actually had senior salespeople join me in a call on a, on a client meeting trying to win business, and I'm talking about sustainability and alignment of sustainability with our prospective client. And that's been a very, very fruitful conversation that, that helped tip the balance and win us significant amounts of revenue and deals, but also makes a stickiness with the client too, because you go, okay, we're working together on this. What other problems do you have that we can work together and try and solve? You know, so it adds a new dimension to your sales strategy, definitely. And I'm guessing with that comes, obviously, if you've got it evidence-based and everybody's confident, <laughs> seeing the same story, same kind of narrative, Yep. then I, I can see that would be hugely advantageous. Does there come with it, though, the risk that we all get a little bit too carried away and then this whole thing of greenwashing, which, again, from a marketer's perspective, is obviously yep. a monster challenge. D does that then rear its head if we all get a little bit too excited with this? Yeah, and unfortunately, I have burst a few marketing bubbles in my career of, of very keen marketing people come up with some great creative, and I just said, oh, you, you can't, we can't do that yet. Um, so definitely you've got to make sure your backyard's in order. Any claim you make, especially if you're going to blow the marketing budget at it and go really hard at it, I would strongly, strongly recommend you have third-party validation on that, not just you saying, hey, it's great, okay? And expert certifications, all that sort of transparency is really a must. Um, but once you've got all that, yeah, you can go. You can definitely do push the boundaries a, a bit around that. Um, but in the constraints of the context. So, you know, I just ran a greenwashing workshop for a, a large retailer um, just last month, and he put up some, just too many examples up there. But, you know, there was like, um, your listeners will find this a bit funny, but, you know, baby wipes, biodegradable. Okay, but if you don't get shit on it, you know, if you don't use it for the purpose of its intent, it's not biodegradable. So, you know, if you don't use it for what it's intended to use, yes, it's biodegradable. But if you actually use it to clean up mess of a baby, it's definitely not. So these are certain things which you can get caught up in and using the lame sort of eco-friendly, sustainable, planet healthy, you know, those sort of things get a third party certification around it that's trusted. OK, don't just come up with your own claim. So with all that said, then, Lee, I think it's obviously the time we've mentioned and you've mentioned a number of times the book. And uh, obviously there is the book, How to Build Sustainability into Your Business Strategy. How do people get hold of a copy? Yeah, sure. It's on Amazon. So you can just look up from the title or my author name, which is Lee Stewart, L-E-E-S-T-E-W-A-R-T. -E -E so it's available on Kindle and um, print on demand as well. Wonderful. And a final question before we uh, wrap up uh, the episode. Do you feel hopeful that sustainability is going to be solved and um, businesses are going to be able to, in the not too distant future, kind of really contribute to a, a better planet and better society? Yeah, absolutely. Although throughout my career of 20 plus years, there have been a number of false starts. and But in the last two years, even, this feels very, very different in terms of the number of people I'm seeing at conferences, there were the 
where 20 or 50 are now four or 500 people. The, the, the game's moved. This is the opportunity of our career, of our lifetime, and it's no better time than to embrace sustainability than right now for, for profit ultimately, but for the other benefits that we all live in the one planet and we've got to do better. Mm. Well said. Lee Stewart, thank you so much for your time today. Awesome. Thanks, Neil.